So hi, everyone. Um, uh, welcome back. This will be the second group of contributed talks in the conference. Um, so this time uh, we're going to have um, four talks back to back and then the Q&A afterwards uh, as before. So for the first talk, uh, we will have Gorian Alagic speaking about impossibility of quantum virtual black box obfuscation of classical circuits. Hey, thanks. Can, can you guys see the slides and hear me? Okay, great. So, uh, whoops. So this is joint work with uh, Zika, Ifka, and Chris. And we showed that it's not possible to use quantum mechanics to obfuscate classical programs uh, in this black box manner. So I'll be using Ifka's very nice slides. So first, what's obfuscation? So it's just some method for turning a useful program into a functionally equally useful program, which is somehow unreadable in terms of code. And this output program doesn't necessarily have to be a program itself. It could potentially be something, some object that you can evaluate the original function with, like let's say a quantum state. Um, and we're interested in kind of cryptographic strength obfuscation, which demands three properties. The first one is that efficiency is preserved. Uh, the second is that functionality is preserved. And the third is the obfuscation property, which says roughly that anything that you can learn um, using uh, by studying the obfuscated circuit kind of as input, you can also learn just by plugging stuff in and seeing what comes out. So as an oracle. So in our case, the obfuscated object will be a quantum state. So we'll also need some public algorithm which tells us how to use the state to evaluate the program. So I just want to emphasize, you know, that the comparison we're making here is between two very different things. You know, on the left-hand side, the adversary is really able to, you know, get the obfuscated circuit as input, you know, study it, take it apart, do all sorts of interesting things with it. And in the other case, the simulator is only able to kind of ask it questions. So, you know, an obfuscator that kind of makes these two things equivalent uh, is a pretty strong kind of uh, object. Okay. So it's been known for some time that uh, classically obfuscation is impossible. And the counterexample circuit family looks something like this. It's, it's a certain point function combined with an encryption of the special input on which the point function does something interesting. And then a checker circuit, which tells you whether you're holding an encryption of the special output, right? So there's that family. And now, um, Technically, the task is to distinguish this kind of family from a family where the point function is just zero everywhere. Right? So it's pretty easy to tell with, a, with only Oracle access that you can't distinguish these two families. Um, however, with a circuit, you can. Um, and the easiest way to see this, um, nowadays at least, not, not when the proof, when this paper was originally written, is using homomorphic encryption. Okay? So the first step is to simply uh, extract this encryption of the special input then to homomorphically evaluate the circuit on that, that gives you an encryption of the special output. And now you can use this third component, this checker part to see that you do indeed have an interesting, you know, you have a point function and not a zero function. Okay, so this is the classical impossibility uh, counter example. So now what about the case of quantum states, which is what we look at. So there's a couple of problems. So we're gonna use kind of the same idea for the counter example family, but there's sort of two obstacles, one maybe not so difficult and the other one a little more challenging. One is how to do this homo homomorphic evaluation given that what we have is a quantum state and not a circuit. And the other problem is the reusability problem. So in this, you know, in the previous example, we had to use this circuit three times uh, to perform various tasks. And it could be that uh, the obfuscator that produces quantum states, you know, the, the, its output just sort of blows up after you use it once due to measurement, let's say. So the first um, ingredient is relatively easy to get around just using the, the new uh, quantum FHE ingredient that we now have. And the second one requires a little bit of a trick. The trick is basically to turn two of these three parts into classical information so that we can extract them from the obfuscated state without damaging it. And then to leave kind of the third part um, for last. And if at that point the state blows up, that's okay, because we're done. So how does that work in a little bit of detail? 
So this part already, uh, this encryption of the special input, that's already classical. Um, so this, this third part, this checker circuit, it turns out we can also make classical. And the way we do that is by using um, a classical obfuscation program, uh, or sorry, a classical obfuscator, which works for this very limited class of circuits. Okay, so this is based on um, a certain version of LWE. Okay, so once we've done that, we now have kind of two classical pieces to the obfuscation, both of which we can extract uh, and then revert to the original state. So that's what we do. And now the third step is the one that you know may destroy the state, but that's okay. And that's the uh, quantum FHE execution of this point function. Okay. And now finally we can run this classical checker, which we have in our hands. So just comparing to previous results, um, certainly we achieved kind of more in terms of impossibility. However, we also needed to tack on some additional assumptions and it would be nice to see if we can relax those a little bit. Uh, so I won't say much about this secure software leasing paper. It's uh, another work which was done in parallel. They, they prove some additional things like impossibility of copy protection and in addition, this, this result that I'm talking about. And uh, maybe I'll just end with um, two things that would be interesting to look at in future work. One, I guess I already brought up, which is relaxing some of these assumptions. And the other is looking at uh, possibility. And here a natural thing to look at is indistinguishability obfuscation which is a weaker form, but is perhaps possible. So thank you. Great, thank you. Um, so for people who might've joined recently, um, I'll just refresh on how we're handling Q&A. Um, so basically there's a Q&A feature within Zoom. So if you have a question for any of the speakers, you can type your question there and um, be sure to say who it's for, just so we know which of the speakers. And then after all four talks are over, then we're going to have a discussion about those questions. Okay, so um, for the uh, uh, second talk of this session, we have um, Amri uh, Shmuley, who is going to be discussing scalable pseudo-random quantum states. Thank you, Carl. I'm just sharing my screen. Okay. Can you see the uh, slide? Okay, perfect. So uh, welcome everyone to this talk on scalable pseudo-random quantum states. Uh, my name is Omrish Mueli, and this is a joint work with uh, Tzvika Borkelsky. So in this work, uh, we focus on the efficient generation of quantum random states. And it is a basic fact in quantum information theory that efficiently generating a truly random quantum state is impossible. And this follows by a basic uh, counting argument. And because if we think of the space of all n qubit quantum state, this is an infinite space, but even if we discretize it, uh, for any negligible precision, the number of points is going to be too big. And we cannot hope to efficiently sample from this uh, distribution. So one solution is to look for a more, a more modest uh, goal that uh, asks that uh, we are going to find an efficiently assemblable distribution such that for a bounded number of copies, uh, this uh, 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 T copies from our sample distribution and T copies from a truly random quantum state are going to be indistinguishable. Uh, for example, we know that for T equals one, this is trivial. A random classical string is uh, indistinguishable, perfectly indistinguishable from a uh, one copy of a truly random quantum state. And the, the larger the T, uh, the less and less trivial uh, it becomes to sample and still make it uh, indistinguishable. So there are a few uh, types of uh, uh, approaches that uh, um, implement this solution. And one of them is called a, a pseudo random quantum state generator. So this is a officially separable distribution such that for any polynomial number of copies T, a, a, a sampled state from this distribution and a, a truly random quantum state, if we look at T copies of, uh, from each of the distribution, they are going to be computationally indistinguishable which means indistinguishable for polynomial time quantum circuits. So uh, let's see the definition. Uh, uh, the notion of pseudo random quantum state were first introduced by uh, G, Liu and Song in uh, crypto 2018. So this is an efficient quantum algorithm uh, G. Uh, um, it gets a N, a, a size of the quantum state that it outputs, a classical key K. And 
the definition is exactly as I said, when we think about uh, the sampled state uh, for any polynomial number of copies, it is going to be uh, computationally indistinguishable from the same number of copies of a truly random n qubit quantum state. And these generators are known to exist based on the existence of post quantum one way functions. Uh, okay, so one specific property that exists in all PRS, uh, previous PRS generator is that what we think of the security parameter and the number that we think of as the size of the output state, this is exactly the same number. So let's recall for a moment uh, the security definition, the security guarantee of a PRS generator. Uh, what we're seeing is in blue is the, uh, the size of the quantum state and what we're seeing is red is the security parameter. This is the number that denotes how many copies we're going to let the adversary have and how hard is it going to be for the adversary to distinguish uh, between the two distribution given the number of copies. And from an operational point of view, this essentially means that the more we want to make our state random, we, we need to use more quantum memory. The larger our, our output state of our uh, sample distribution becomes. And the question that we are trying to answer in this work is, can we create a small, highly pseudo-random state? And in more formal terms, can we make a, a PRS generator when it has a, two independent parameters? A, one is the output of the a, output state, and one, sorry, is the size of the output state. This is n, and lambda is the security parameter. Okay, so this is the definition of a scalable PRS generator. And, okay, yes, and we can see that uh, uh, these uh, two parameters are independent completely. And there is a reason that uh, we, we don't have a security parameter in previous works. And this reason, if we look at the output distribution, the, the support of, of previous PRS generators, then all of the states in the supports are uniform amplitude, uniform superpositions with a, only the phases are random and the amplitudes are all the same, uniform. And one natural question to ask, well, how does it do, for example, for the smallest number, for the smallest output size, one qubit? And we know that a, a random one qubit state is, covers the entire block sphere and a previous a PRS non-scalable generators, they only cover this red ring here which is uh, uh, easy to efficiently distinguish from a truly random one qubit quantum state. And what we want to achieve is instead of randomizing only the phases, we want to randomize only the, also the amplitudes, regardless of the size of the quantum state. And uh, briefly, our results is that uh, uh, we define and explore this notion of scalability, this independence, between the size of the output state and the security parameter, how random the state is. Uh, more specifically, uh, we show a framework for uh, constructing such a scalable uh, random quantum objects. And formally, uh, we show uh, the existence of scalable PRS generators, assuming post-quantum one way functions. Uh, in particular, the same computational assumption uh, for non-scalable PRS generators. And we also uh, show for another notion uh, uh, of uh, uh, efficient generation of quantum state called the uh, T-design, which I didn't uh, uh, define. Uh, we improve the efficiency of existing scalable T-design generators. Existing scalable uh, T-design uh, T generators uh, had depth of a uh, polynomial in N, lambda, and T. And we show a generator with depth polynomial in N, lambda, and log of T. Uh, for any polynomial number of copies, uh, Tn. And thank you very much for listening. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, the next speaker, go ahead and set up the next set of slides. Okay, great. So uh, for our next talk, um, we have uh, Andrea Colodangelo, who is going to speak about a quantum money solution to the blockchain scalability problem. I think you hear me fine.
Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, um, in this brief overview, uh, I'll tell you about joint work with Orsatat. And in this work, we show how to combine um, a blockchain with quantum money to achieve a payment system that enjoys uh, the best of both worlds and resolves the so-called scalability problem of blockchains. So, what is this problem? Well, um, in a nutshell, oops, in a nutshell, most blockchain designs suffer from the following loosely defined problem, which is that the amount of resources or time required per transaction grows badly with the number of users involved. And so loosely speaking, solving this problem means keeping the amount of resources and time used per transaction approximately constant. So an example of this problem are the long waiting times for transactions confirmations on the Bitcoin blockchain and the limited throughput of transactions, meaning a limited number of transactions that the system can handle per second. And so um, very briefly, let me say a few words about the main ingredients of our payment system. These are blockchains and quantum money. So what is a blockchain? Well, you can think of a blockchain as a sequence of blocks and each block contains information about some previous transactions. And how does a user add a new transaction? Well, let's say that Alice wants to pay four coins to Bob. At a high level, this is how she does it. She will broadcast the transaction, Alice pays four coins to Bob, to the whole network. And this transaction is not immediately added to a block, but it goes to what is known as a pool of pending transactions. And every once in a while, a new block is formed containing transactions from this pool. And this happens via some consensus mechanism that involves the users in the network. And at the end of this, the new block is appended to the old sequence of blocks. And so how should we think of one particular transaction? Well, uh, in its most general form, a transaction allows a user to deposit a number of coins. And these coins can be released and spent according to a set of instructions. These instructions are also specified by whoever is depositing the coins. Okay, and this set of instructions could really be anything that can be specified via code. And such generic transactions are referred to as smart contracts and they're very general. And so payments are just a very special case of a smart contract. And so the pros of a blockchain is certainly that it's decentralized. It requires no bank or trusted third party. Another pro is that it is digital in the sense that unlike physical cash, you don't have to meet in person to exchange it. And the con is that in the absence of a trusted third party, a consensus mechanism is necessary. And this takes time and is usually the bottleneck in terms of efficiency. Now, the other ingredient of our payment system is quantum money, which I won't, I won't describe in, in this brief overview, but um, specifically, our payment system relies on a stronger version of public key, public key quantum money, which is called quantum lightning. This was introduced formally by Zandri and informally some years earlier by Lutomirsky and co-authors who called it collision-free quantum money. Now, uh, quantum lightning is just public key quantum money with an added feature, namely that no generation procedure, not even the honest one, should be able to produce two banknotes with the same serial number except with negligible probability. And in a regular public key quantum money scheme, this is certainly not the case because the bank who creates a banknote can typically create as many copies as it wants of it. And so here are the pros and cons of public key quantum money and quantum lightning. Uh, by definition of security, it cannot be public key quantum money cannot be counterfeited. Uh, another pro is that potentially it could be transferred very quickly technology permitting via quantum channels or quantum teleportation. And on top of that, it does not require a consensus mechanism. The downside is that it requires a bank, right? A trusted third party who mints the banknotes. And so to recap in quantum lightning scheme, no one can generate two valid banknotes with the same serial number. And this is, is, is sort of interesting because it opens to the possibility of removing the trusted third party because we no longer have to trust the bank not to produce many banknotes with the same serial number and this was a concern before however the question that remains is how do you prevent people from creating many quantum banknotes with potentially different serial numbers 
This does not violate the security of quantum lightning. So there should be a mechanism to regulate such a generation procedure. And in this work, we provide, we provide precisely this, um, such a mechanism and this leverages smart contracts on a blockchain. So all in all, um, our payment system combines a classical blockchain and quantum lightning and removes the cons of both. In particular, it requires no trusted third party and payments are still as quick as sending a quantum state from Alice to Bob. And no consensus mechanism is uh, required involving other users other than Alice and Bob. Okay, so this is all that I wanted to say for this brief overview. Thank you. Great, thanks, Andrea. Um, so can we now have the fourth set of slides? Uh, yep, that will okay. be me. Uh, I hope you can see that. Okay, so for the final talk, um, we will have Alessandro Fedrizi, who will speak about experimental quantum conference key agreement. Yeah, thanks. Uh, this talk is why this session was called Mostly Theory. I have to bother you with an experimental talk to end the day. Um, so my name is Alessandro. I'm at Harriet Watt University, and this work was done in my lab uh, under the umbrella of the UK Quantum Communications Hub led by the University of York. Um, right. Good. So, um, you know, this the setting that we are in, the Zoom call, is a perfect uh, background for, for uh, my topic, which is quantum conference key agreement. So we're all in this conference, uh, in this conference call, and most of you know that these things uh, aren't terribly secure, or at least there was a lot of the news of, you know, Zoom being hacked and all that, right? So quantum conference key agreement moves beyond this two-party paradigm, and it tries to establish an identical key between uh, any number of users uh, simultaneously. So how does this work? You have a quantum server. It distributes GHZ states uh, to one user called Alice and any number of Bobs. So uh, this goes via the quantum channel. And then uh, the measurement protocol um, is very simple. There's a pre-shared sequence um, of rounds, um, which are either Z measurements, so that's zero or one, uh, so all the bobs and all, and Alice, uh, they they all uh, measure either uh, this uh, said um, measurement or an X measurement for parameter estimation. So once they've got these uh, measurements done, they estimate the security parameters, uh, and then they go on to the post processing. Um, all the details on on uh, the security proofs and all that that you uh, guys would mostly be interested in the mostly theory session uh, in this uh, theory paper from Dagmar Bruce's group. Um, I'm just going to show you quickly how we implement that in the lab. Um, so how do you make a GHZ state? Uh, we've got a TISAF laser, the 320 megahertz clock rate, uh, and we create uh, entangled photons in a down conversion source. So one of these sources seen up uh, at the top here uh, makes an entangled uh, bell state. And then we make a second one, we fuse those together. And in the end, we make a four user uh, telecom wavelength uh, GHZ state. And we send it down a bunch of fibers. So we've got four users. The first one's Alice, uh, that's next to the source uh, effectively. And then there's Bob1, Bob2, Bob3. And we've got a range of different uh, fibers uh, connected to those guys up to a total of uh, 50 kilometers. Right. Now, um, there's uh, two main results that we've got. Uh, the first one would be the asymptotic uh, key that we can uh, derive from the, the detected raw uh, rates. So uh, here, these data points at the top is the fractional key rate. Uh, the remarkable feature here is that, um, you know, we've got a qubit error rate of around three to four or five percent. Uh, what you see here is that this doesn't depend on the distance almost. So uh, all the qubit error is introduced by the state quality and, and hardly anything gets added by the fiber. And this is for us remarkable because it shows that we can send, uh, you know, this is a four partite, genuinely entangled four partite state and we can send it over 50 kilometers of fiber, which is, which is quite a distance. The rates down at the bottom, uh, we don't start with very much, uh, 30 hertz at the source roughly, and then it goes down uh, to roughly two hertz secure key rate in this asymptotic limit uh, over 12 dB loss. Right, now um, we haven't got uh, that many rounds, so we need to do a finite key analysis. 
This was introduced uh, for a conference key agreement in a separate paper by our co-worker Federico Grasselli. Um, and so what you can see here in the dashed line is that's the um, hypothetical upper bound on what we can achieve in, in this uh, finite key um, analysis from the Rockies that we generate for one particular fiber setting. And the red dots are the ones that, uh, that's the actual key, secure key that we achieve with full multi-party uh, post-processing. So that's with LDPC, multi-party uh, error correction and privacy amplification. So in the end, we get roughly a megabit of key, uh, secure key, and uh, we encrypt an image and send that to the users. So that's um, experimental uh, quantum conference key agreement with four users. Um, now, the key question is, uh, what is this useful for? Because obviously the rates aren't, uh, you know, very high when you, when you send a GH set uh, state down a bunch of fibers. Now, the main advantage uh, is in networks. Um, so, you know, we, we've got roughly around 120 participants in this call. Just imagine you're all uh, on a node of a, of a future quantum network. And let's also assume that the quantum network will provide us with a multipartite entangled resource, which will get refreshed in the background at not a very high rate. Now, uh, you know, if you pick uh, out any uh, number of nodes uh, from this network um, and uh, these users all request uh, simultaneously a conference key, uh, then uh, if you were to do that with pairwise, so the traditional QKD between, you know, A and B1, A and B2, A and B3, and where then to X or all these keys, then you had to uh, use N, N minus one times uh, this resource. So, as you know, you have to throw away the entire resource most in the least efficient way uh, to, to get all these pairwise keys. But uh, in, the, in the best uh, possible case, you can do the, uh, the same thing with just uh, a single uh, network use and make uh, directly a GHZ state between all these users. And so a quantum conference key agreement can achieve up to an N uh, minus one uh, time advantage uh, over just traditional QKD. And that's all I wanna say. Uh, look at the longer talk if you wanna see more or have a look at the paper in the archive. Um, this was our team, mostly Joseph Ho, who should be hanging around uh, also in, uh, in, in the participant uh, list there, Massimiliano, and of course Federico Grasselli, our co-worker from Düsseldorf, Peter and Mehul Malik, who runs an independent group at Harriet Watt, and that's it. Thank you. Great. Thanks to all four speakers uh, from this session. And at this point, I will turn it over to Omar. Okay, thanks also for, to the speakers. So uh, yeah, I don't see any questions in the Q&A right now. So I encourage you to, uh, to ask your questions if you have one. So uh, in the meantime, to start the discussion, let me uh, ask some questions to the speakers. So uh, yeah, first uh, to, uh, in, in order, so to Gorian. Uh, so um, can you say a bit more about um, uh, the, the assumption that you use or in what sense you use this assumption, this computational assumption, LWE4, uh, to show that it's impossible to get obfuscation. Can you say a bit more about the statement, what the statement is? Sure, so um, so we use, we use kind of two varieties of the, well, actually there's kind of three assumptions floating around. One is just the, um, well, two of them are different levels of the LWE assumption. One of them we need because we're going to do uh, quantum fully homomorphic encryption to run this, uh, point function homomorphically, right? So remember the circuit counter example has this point function in there and only if you plug in, if you start from an encryption of the special input and homomorphically evaluate that thing, then you get the sort of this encryption of the special output and then you can notice that something interesting happens. So there we need quantum fully homomorphic encryption and the existing, scheme, existing schemes for this uh, require um, LWE as well as maybe some circular security assumption, but you can get rid of that. Um, the other place where we need the assumption is that, um, you know, this checker circuit that at the end, once we're holding the encryption of the special output, we need to check that, you know, it really is what, what we hope it is. Uh, so this checker circuit has to actually be also be obfuscated inside the example using a classical obfuscator. Um, of course, this obfuscator only works for a very limited class of circuits. So this doesn't violate the impossibility. Uh, but this this construction also requires LWE. It's like a stronger form of LWE. But yeah, so those are the so those are the computational assumptions and how they fit in. Does that? Yes. That's thanks a lot. Um, so yeah, I see there are some questions in the chat. 
So it's simpler if people ask questions in the Q&A rather than in the chat. chat. I'll, I'll read the ones in the chat, but for future questions. Uh, right, so if I may, there's a question uh, for me. Uh, could you explain more how we can use the Quant Conference Key Agreement Protocol? Uh, well, the main use is to make an identical key between, you know, 10 users, 20 users, uh, instead of just two users. Does that answer the question? Um, what the advantage is um, over just doing pairwise keys and then XORing them all together to make, uh, to make such a key, um, that advantage comes, for example, in networks, as I just said, because for if you have a, a quantum network, then under some circumstances, you can make a GHZ state very quickly, while it might be very costly to make just bipartite Bell states. So maybe I can actually also ask the question I had myself. So the thing is that as panelists, we cannot write in the Q&A. That's why I was writing it in the chat, uh, Omar. Um, so my question was for Andrea, like what are the requirements for actual implementation of quantum lightning? Uh, so for instance, if you really wanna implement your scheme, then uh, do you have to perform like large coherent uh, preparation of multiple qubits? Yeah, so at, at least for the, the construction that we know, um, so the only concrete construction we have is, is you know, requires a highly entangled state. And uh, I don't think we expect, uh, so I expect it to be possible to, to do it with uh, sort of, you know, product of single qubit states or something like that. Uh, I think Ors, Or has a comment about, do, uh, about this. Um, but yeah, so certainly, you know, as far as implementing this, um, it would be, I mean, experimentally very complicated. Uh, so it's nothing that we can expect to do in, in the near future, at least. Okay, let me move on with another question to Omri. So uh, uh, you mentioned T designs for states. So if I understood correctly, you're, you're, uh, you have a new construction of state T designs. Uh, can you say a bit more about that? Yes. Uh, so what we actually uh, do construct is one thing that we call an ARS generator. This is an efficient quantum algorithm that given Oracle access to a random classical function, uh, you can generate a output distribution such that for any polynomial number of copies, it is going to be statistically indistinguishable from the same number of polynomial copies of a truly random quantum state. Now, because this is statistical indistinguishability, we can swap this truly random function f with the two ty's uh, independent classical function. And that, then by the, I think this is a result by Zandri uh, showing that you can swap the truly random function f with the two ty's independent classical function and get a, a t design. So this, this way we get a T design for any polynomial number of output copies. Okay, thanks a lot. Sure. So we have another question for Gorian. So how much weaker, so yeah, role of, I was asking, how much weaker do you think the notions of quantum obfuscation can be? Um, well, I'm, I'm not sure if I exactly understand the question, but maybe, maybe I can make two related comments. I mean, you know, one thing to point out is that like all of these impossibility results, what we're showing is that there exists a particular class of circuits, which is not obfuscatable. So this doesn't rule out that obfuscation is possible for, you know, a large family of very useful circuits for certain applications. Um, and I suppose in principle, that class could be different for classical and quantum. Um, and I think very little is kind of known about that. I mean, I guess one concrete example are these classical obfuscators for computing compare functions, like the ones that we used in our uh, counter example. So, that's, so that class is actually obfuscatable, even just classically. Um, I guess the other direction maybe to think about is, um, you know, obfuscation of quantum programs. And so there's this weaker notion of indistinguishability obfuscation, which it doesn't ask for this sort of very strong equivalence between analyzing the circuit and just asking the circuit questions. It's some weaker notion, but still, at least in the classical world, apparently very useful. And so one could think about whether, whether one can, that can exist in the, in the quantum setting.
Okay, so there are a few questions by the panelists right now. So I see a question, for example, by Fred. So maybe Fred, you can uh, ask your question directly. Yes, so uh, Omri, uh, I was wondering whether this, uh, so you have a technique for uh, generating uh, uh, state T designs. So I was wondering if it's possible to, uh, to generate unitary T designs using a similar mm -hmm. technique somehow. So yeah, great question. Uh, we didn't manage to give a positive, we don't know. We don't know. We don't know how to, to use it uh, for the unitary case, only for states. Okay, so that's an, to file under open questions, I guess. Yeah, open question. Great open Thanks. question. Andrea had a question as well. Yeah, uh, so yeah. Gregorian. Oh, okay. okay. You got well, it. I can just read. It. So it's a great question. You know, uh, so uh, Andrea is pointing out that in the classical impossibility proof, you don't need to assume anything. And the reason is that you can use, you know, you assume that obfuscation exists. This gives you one-way functions. And this turns out to be enough to build kind of a limited form of homomorphic encryption, which you can then use in the counterexample. Um, so we don't know how, that's a great question, whether one can do that in the quantum case. Um, we don't know how to pull it off. Yes, because we, we tried hard. Uh, it's a really nice question. I mean, I don't think we ran into any sort of obstacle that says, no, this, this just can't work. Um, but it does seem to require some 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 new ideas and maybe some new understanding about what what can and can't be done with uh, QFHE. Uh, yeah, great question. Thanks. So something popped up in the Q and A for me. If I may just take that one. Um, so uh, in the quantum conference key agreement. Can for question, please, just uh... sorry. Yeah, can you just. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, yeah, so it says here, may I ask a, a question on quantum conference key agreement? Do all users need to directly connect to a centralized server? Um, that means Starship. And uh, each in the pod, do all inter intermediate nodes still have to be trusted? Also, if users are allowed to be trusted, can Alice Bob 1, Bob 1, 2, and so on only perform n minus 1 instead of n times n minus 1 runs? Sorry, it's a long question. Um, so, um, so what we did is, uh, of course, a direct transmission where, you know, you have a quantum channel that goes from Alice to Bob 1 to Bob 2 to Bob 3. Alice can be separate and there can be a quantum server, but in our case, it's next, it's next to the quantum server. The, the example that I showed at the end and that you're probably referring to, that would be, uh, you know, some sort of future network uh, where there's lots of intermediate nodes. And then um, it's probably still an open question what the most efficient way would be to make uh, a conference key between an arbitrary number of nodes there, because it, it, the connectivity is not necessarily such that you can make a huge set state very quickly. Um, and so the naive example that you always have to have Alice involved in pairwise keys to make a conference key in the end, um, uh, that also doesn't have to be the case. So, you know, yes, you can do Bob one, Bob two, Bob two, Bob three, and then sort of make it, try to get, uh, get it to be more efficient. But in the best case, there's certainly an advantage in trying to make a GHZ state directly because that can usually be done more quickly depending on the exact connectivity. Um, uh, the question about trust, um, the source doesn't have to be trusted because it's all based on entanglement, but the bobs all have to be trusted. So because each bob will definitely have a, a copy of the key in the end. So, you know, they all need to be authenticated and so on and so forth. Um, um, so this is a little bit different to quantum secret sharing, which also works with a, um, a GHZ state. In quantum secret sharing, though, uh, all the bobs sort of need to come together, uh, and this is meant to sort of weed out uh, a dishonest bob. Other questions from the panelists or anyone? Okay, if not, then uh, let's thank the, the speakers again. And uh, I guess I'll